become a part of the identity of Wesley Biblical Seminary, as we've had many people come in and speak, scholars, preachers through the years. And so last year, we had Dr. Tom McCall come and present a Wesleyan political theology. And this year, it's really a delight for us to be able to feature this important new book that's published by InterVarsity Press, Holiness. And this book, obviously, we've already indicated in these first few nights, is written by alumni or people who are very connected to us. Caleb Friedman presented last night on the New Testament portion. Dr. Matt Ayers, our president, presented on the Old Testament portion. And today, we'll have the systematic and historical portions of the book presented as well. So it's really a delight for us to have this. But as we get going, let's just start in prayer. Jesus, we thank you for this day, which is a day you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you for bringing us here together safely and for the ministry of Wesley Biblical Seminary through our 50 years. Thank you for raising us up to develop trusted leaders for faithful churches. And we think about the hundreds of alumni who are serving churches, institutions, and your kingdom right now all around the world. And we're also thankful for the 600 students that are a part of Wesley Biblical Seminary at this very moment. And we pray for them, these alumni, these current students, that you use them for your purposes. Thank you for um, creating Wesley Biblical Seminary to be the guardian of a very particular message, a message that comes to us for, with this uh, the authority of the church and the authority of scripture, which we've heard about as we think about this normative call to holiness. Thank you for this. And we pray that you be with Dr. Bounds as he presents to us this morning. We say this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me introduce our speaker here. Uh, but prior to coming to Asbury Theological Seminary, Dr. Chris Bounds served as the Dean of the School of Theology and Ministry and a professor of systematic theology at Indiana Wesleyan University. He's an ordained elder in the Arkansas Conference of the United Methodist Church, where he served as an appointed pastor for eight years. He has a variety of articles published in many peer-reviewed journals, other books, and obviously we're really excited about the book that he's just co-authored with Dr. Ayers and Dr. Friedemann. He serves as on um, the board of trustees of the One Mission Society, commonly just known as OMS. He is the chair of the board of the Francis Asbury Society. He's on the board of directors of Good News, a forum for scriptural Christianity in the United Methodist Church. And he previously, previously served on the board of the Manchester Wesley Research Center. His wife, Tamara, who is with us. Tamara, we're so glad that you are here. They have been married for almost 30 years. They have two children, a daughter, Maris, a son, Morgan, a daughter-in-law, Elise. Chris loves Arkansas Razor basketball, a Razorback basketball. Oh, yes. Notre Dame fighting Irish football. Yes, go Irish. <laughs> and Ben and Jerry's Health Bar Crunch Ice Cream. Very particular there. Ben and Jerry's Health Bar Crunch Ice Cream. It sounds like a request, Chris. Heath, Heath. Heath Bar. Heath. Oh, Heath. oh, sorry. I put an L in there. Um, Heath Bar. Shows that I don't eat Heath Bars. It's being in the South. You add letters to words. Oh, man. Oh, it could be, a, he, and my wife is here. She was trying real hard to communicate to me to get this, like, you, you missed it, Andy, you missed it. And some of you might know, we didn't mention too, that Chris um, is well known and is often a guest at camp meetings around the country, is excellent preacher, functions also as a scholar, delighted to have him present here, a good friend of mine, and he teaches in our Doctor of Ministry program, he's an adjunct professor for us. There's many more things we could say. Uh, this tradition, which... <laughs> I want to be careful, and we'll say this more later, it's not just about serving the tribe or serving the tradition, that's an important thing, but it's the message that we think is true and available for the world. Chris has been a key, not just player, but key voice in this tradition, and it's a real honor for us to have him with us. I just want to give you a little word on what the format is going to be. So we'll have Chris's presentation and then one of our regular professors who teaches on a regular basis for us, Dr. Brian Yike, will be responding to him. And then after that, we'll maybe have some time for some questions. And then we'll take a five-minute break 
and we'll have an additional panel discussion that I'll lead with the three authors, and that will be live on YouTube as well. So we'd love for you to come back and participate in that. That will be a separate event, uh, technically, from this first one. Would you all welcome with me, Dr. Chris Bounce? Thank you. It is a delight for me to have this opportunity to be with you and to have had an opportunity to work with my co-authors. Uh, obviously, uh, I am the old grizzled veteran of the of, of the three. It's been a joy to have a chance to work with uh, young scholars as we have worked together on uh, on this book. But I would miss at the very beginning of our time together if I didn't recognize uh, Dr. Matt Friedemann. Now, the reason why I want to recognize Dr. Friedemann is because if it wasn't for Matt Friedemann's uh, idea and inspiration, this book would have never come about. As a matter of fact, the inspiration for this book took place in a Francis Asbury Society board meeting, and uh, we're doing some brainstorming. And so Matt came up with the idea for uh, this book and contacted uh, uh, Caleb and uh, contacted uh, Dr. Ayers to uh, work on this book and brought us together in our very first Zoom meeting to discuss uh, this book. So I do want to acknowledge uh, the role of the Holy Spirit in uh, Dr. Friedemann's life in bringing about the vision of this book. I also want to begin by saying that the focus of my remarks this morning are really going to be on the systematic, constructive side of the book, not on the historical side. Although, let me begin by saying this in regard to the historical side, in regard to Christian perfection or entire sanctification. And uh, that is, if I believe that John Wesley was the only person, and it was our Methodist tradition, was the only Christian tradition that taught Christian perfection or entire sanctification, I would actually view it with suspicion. I would view it with suspicion. Tom Oden, in his textbook, Classic Christianity, actually makes not a sustained argument, but he makes the argument that Christian perfection is historic Christian orthodoxy. That in other words, this is what historic Christianity has, has taught. So not only is it grounded and rooted as we've seen so beautifully and eloquently through uh, Dr. Ayers and Dr. Friedemann, not only is it grounded uh, in the teaching of scripture, but it is grounded and rooted in the historic witness of, uh, of the church. And the earliest witness of, of Christianity uh, throughout uh, church history. And so when Wesley begins to preach and teach on Christian perfection or entire sanctification, he is simply picking up a mantle that it was grounded not only in scripture, but grounded in the historic Christian reflection of the church. And if you read carefully historical theologians as they talk about Christian perfection or entire sanctification, uh, you will see that, that by and large, there is a common understanding. There, there are some nuances in regard to differences that exist. Uh, some have a slightly higher view of what uh, Christian perfection is. Some have a slightly lower view of what it is. But I will tell you, the history of Christianity is not afraid of the language of perfection and not afraid of the language of entire. And so I want to begin by saying that I won't have time to address the historic Christian witness in regard to this. But really, uh, what is before me is reclaiming a theology of holiness, the life experienced. So my real focus is going to be talking about how do we experience entire sanctification? How do we experience Christian perfection in our lives? So let me begin. You have a handout there, and uh, I'm going to begin on the left, and you will see I've tried to walk through the flow of my argument uh, through letters. I'm, I'm recounting my ABCs. I'm reverting back to my early childhood, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. But I will tell you, it's been so long since I've done my ABCs, there might be a problem in my ordering of the alphabet here. So 
if you can catch that, uh, let me know. But I do know that the first letter of the alphabet is A. Uh, you've now, I've got it. Uh, it's, it's A. And so I want to begin by it, at least giving an overview, and especially the, the great consensus that exists among Wesleyans in our Wesleyan tradition as to what Christian perfection or entire sanctification is. Now, in theology, uh, when you talk about sanctification, you talk about it in both negative and positive ways. And so uh, negatively, in our Wesleyan tradition, but again, grounded in historic Christian orthodoxy, we understand entire sanctification or Christian perfection to be set free from, to be set free. And here's the positive, what we're set free to. So the negative is what we're set free from, and the positive is what we're set free to. As a matter of fact, uh, it's early in the morning. Some of you may have not had enough caffeine. I'm thinking of my wife right here who would like a little more caffeine this morning. If I could just see your hands just for a moment. I'm, I'm taking the role here of uh, Mr. Miki from Creodicia, the theological form. And you can go either way, but set free from, set free to. Would you say that with me? Set free from, set free to. And so uh, negatively, when we experience entire sanctification, we're set free from the power and the condition or sometimes what Wesley called the root of, of, of sin. So you will remember this in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, when the angel appears uh, to, to Joseph to explain to him the miracle of the incarnation. He says that you will give to the incarnate son of God the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. So negatively, entire sanctification is to be set free from the power and the condition of sin. Now, the, the, the power of sin, what is described so, uh, so descriptively in uh, Romans 7, 14 through 25, the good that I want to do, I do not do. That which I do not want to do, I find myself doing. And so uh, entire sanctification, this, this spirit-filled life is to be set free from the power of sin so that the good that I know to do, I'm empowered to do, and the evil I know to avoid, I am empowered to avoid. Set free from the power. But not just set free from the power of sin, but set free from the very condition of sin, the root of sin, the state of sin. As a result of the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden, we all come into this life screwed up. We all come into this life with something wrong with us. And we describe it in the way that it manifests itself in our lives. I will call this a phenomenological definition of this condition of sin. It's a, a propensity towards rebellion, disobedience, selfishness, and sin. So sin comes easily uh, to us. It is sort of our default position in life as a result of the fall. Uh, Wesley fondly described this condition of sin, original sin, as pride, self-will, uh, jealousy, uh, love of people's praise, love for the fallen pleasures of this world. We come into this life with that sort of event. Now, what causes this event? For Wesley, it is the corrupted moral image of God. It is uh, the absence of the reign and rule of, of the Holy Spirit. So because the image of God in us has been cor corrupted, it has been privated in us uh, as a result of the Holy Spirit not reigning and ruling in our hearts and our lives, um, we don't have something, so to speak, strong enough that can rightly order our uh, desires in life. And so to be set free uh, from an entire sanctification is to be set free from this power and from this nature of sin. That's the negative. And so what are we set free to? That is to love God with our entire being and to love neighbor as self. It is set free to live into, to, to flourish in the very purposes for which we have been created. So. Uh, let me just say this. You read Wesleyan uh, articles of religion, confession of faith among the, the Wesleyan denominations. Uh, you're going to see these sort of ideas being set free from and being set free to. So there is a general agreement 
in our Wesleyan tradition as to what entire sanctification is. Now, disagreements, though, and this is my next point, uh, there, there really is two eight huge areas of, of disagreement in our Wesleyan uh, tradition. And uh, that has to do with not the what, what is it, but, but when is it? Uh, when is it experienced? When is it realized in, in Christian life? And really, in the history of the Wesleyan tradition, there are two trajectories, and uh, both of them have their roots in Wesley. Now, I, I don't study Wesley like uh, Chris, and I don't study Wesley like, like Brian in here. I, I would say I dabble in Wesley. I would not call myself a, a, a Wesley scholar. But I, I, I will tell you that um, Wesley uh, lived long enough to know that he can be confusing. And if you want, from my perspective, a clear indication at times of his confusion, then read his plain account of Christian perfection, which is hardly a plain account. But we do see that depending on when you read Wesley, you might get different opinions for him. And this is particularly true in regard to his teaching on Christian perfection and entire sanctification. Now, Wesley's consistent as to what it is, but in regard to when it is experienced, uh, we see uh, some differences, and, and these two trajectories are going to follow these two, can I call them Wesleys? I will call one the optimistic Wesley, and the optimistic Wesley is the Wesley that we see in the scripture way of salvation. It's picked up in what is called the shorter way tradition. And it comes from the scripture way of salvation. And here's what Wesley says. Why not this hour, this moment? Certainly, uh, you may look for it now if you believe it is by faith. And he goes on to say, expect it by faith, expect it as you are, and expect it now. Now, do I hear an amen? That, 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 that's incredibly optimistic and positive in regard to the experience of entire sanctification. That's the optimistic Wesley. And the shorter way, which is what the American holiness tradition is going to pick up on. But there is this pessimistic Wesley. And we can see the pessimism of Wesley in his brief thoughts on perfection. If you've ever read Wesley's plain account of Christian perfection, often as a part of the plain account, you have this addendum brief thoughts on perfection. And Wesley says in regard to entire sanctification or Christian perfection, as to the time, I believe this instant generally is the instant of death, the moment before the soul leaves the body. And so Wesley is, is saying here that most people are not going to experience Christian perfection or entire sanctification until just before death. Now, Wesley will go on and qualify. He says, you know, it may be experienced 20 years, 30 years before death. But generally speaking, this is, this is generally when most people are going to experience it. And so this is going to lead to what I will call and what has been generally called the longer way tradition. And so that entire sanctification and Christian perfection is something we're ever moving towards, but most of us will never really realize it in life. And these two trajectories, the longer and shorter way, are represented in different denominations, and you can see it in their denominational statements. So the shorter way can be seen in those particular traditions that have their origin in the American holiness tradition, the 19th century. So you see it in denominations like the Wesleyan Church, the Church of the Nazarene, the uh, Salvation Army, the Churches of Christ in, in Christian Union, in American holiness denominations, you can see this shorter way. And it's this shorter way theology that drove the whole holiness camp meeting movement, of which many of us are still participating in. And again, many institutions that were established coming out of this shorter way tradition. But then there is this longer way tradition. The, and we see it in the United Methodist Church, the British Methodist Church, and the African Methodist Episcopal Church. By the way, you can see it in the type of questions that is asked of ordinance. 
So in this shorter way tradition, this more optimistic view, um, as you're seeking ordination, you are asked the question, are you entirely sanctified? Yes or no? Yes or no? And uh, for some of these traditions, if you say no, uh, then your ordination process stops dead in the water. Some of these traditions require that their pastors testify to the experience of entire sanctification. So, I mean, these traditions are, this, that's the question they ask, are you entirely sanctified, yes or no? And the real expectation is that you are entirely sanctified. Well, in the longer way tradition, the question is asked in such a way that it implies that when you're being ordained, you haven't experienced entire sanctification. You haven't experienced Christian perfection. And so the question often in this long way is, do you expect, do you expect to be perfected in love in this life? Obviously not now, but maybe at some point before you die, you, you do expect to realize this. So and we agree on what entire sanctification is, but in regard to uh, when we experience it, there are differences that divide us as Wesleyans. Here is a, a second area that, divide, uh, that divides us. And um, that is really in the end, what we have been exploring, what, what Dr. Ayers and Dr. Friedemann have been exploring with us. And, and that is whether or not entire sanctification is the normative Christian life whether or not this is the life that is meant for every Christian to be living out. And um, one, which comes from the longer way uh, tradition, really ties entire sanctification to ultimate Christian maturity. It is uber maturity in Christ. And so uh, oftentimes it's described in this way in the most literal sense not just in the figurative, but in the most literal sense, it is to have the mind of Christ, to think as Christ would think. It is to speak as Christ would speak, and it is to do as Christ would speak, but it's uber maturity. And so uh, from this perspective, the longer way perspective, yes, there are probably some people in the body of Christ who have experienced this, but most people haven't. So uh, the longer way does not see entire sanctification or Christian perfection as normative for the ordinary believer. But the shorter way does. And as a matter of fact, the shorter way is it's articulated, makes a clear distinction between entire sanctification and Christian maturity. And it usually goes something along these lines that entire sanctification is to have power and purity. It's to have purity of heart. It's to be set free from the condition of sin. It is to have power, which is to uh, be set free from the power of sin. That's all that entire sanctification, Christian perfection gives to us. But we lack knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, which is necessary for Christian maturity. How many of you realize that it's quite possible to have power and purity, but lack knowledge, wisdom, and understanding in what needs to be done in regard to God's will? Yeah. yeah. And so part of what progressive sanctification, not all don't have a chance to explore here, but part of what progressive sanctification is shorter is adding knowledge, wisdom, and understanding uh, as a part of as we continue to grow. But from the shorter way perspective, entire sanctification is really what sets you free, what sets us free to move towards maturity. Uh, one of, and I'll talk about this in, in just a moment. Well, I, I'll, I won't talk about it. Well, anyway, those are, those are two very uh, different views about uh, when it is experienced and even some of the nuances. You know, is it uber maturity or is it something that makes maturity possible. This separates the longer and uh, the uh, shorter way. All right, now moving to the middle of the page. Tried to set this up here. What has driven my life is, is believe it or not, it's, it's being a pastor. 
Uh, what has driven my life is being an evangelist. What has uh, driven my life is to be entrusted with the care of souls and leading and guiding them in the way of salvation. And so really what has driven me is how do you help people to genuinely experience this sanctifying work uh, it, and to not settle for anything less uh, than the genuine experience in heart and in uh, life. And um, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I am drawn to the shorter way. I'm drawn to the American holiness tradition. And the reason why I'm drawn to it is because of its optimism and expectation that this sanctified life is the normative Christian experience. So what I'm going to try to do, I'm going to try to talk about uh, the American holiness theology that develops in the 19th century in this country. And again, is in many ways the basis for Wesley Biblical Seminary, the basis for both Asbury Universities, Indiana Wesleyan University. It comes out of this 19th century American holiness theology. And so what I want to do now is just talk about what are some of the advantages of it? All too often, let me say this, um, some of us get educated and we start looking down upon our poor provincial American holiness. Now, you don't do that, but anybody who's, who's been in graduate school or has been in seminary, oftentimes when we talk about the American holiness uh, tradition, um, it's done in many ways. Please hear me, people coming from it, done with some degree of disdain. Uh, I thank God for places like Wesley Biblical Seminary. I thank God for holiness denominations that come out of this tradition that hold to the optimism and recognizing this isn't just for a few. This is not just for the spiritual elite, but this is for the ordinary believer. All right, but here's some of the advantages, and I've already mentioned some of them, so I, I won't go into great detail on them. First of all, it believes an entirely sanctified life is the normative Christian experience. Hallelujah. That the holiest desires of our heart can be unshackled and unchained. And that our will can be so transformed and empowered uh, that we can truly have purity and power. And that being what so that our lives truly can be defined by love. The love of God and the love of, of, of neighbor. So it believes an entirely sanctified life is the normative Christian experience to the longer way. Second, it makes a clear distinction between entire sanctification and Christian maturity uh, as uh, the longer way focuses on uber Christian maturity. But third, the holiness movement's shorter way often, although not always, nuances its understanding of salvation from sin's condition and uh, perfect love. Maybe it is because of the type of reflection that uh, takes place. So salvation from sin's uh, condition, this bent, uh, this propensity and tendency towards rebellion and, and disobedience. If you read Wesley's plain account of Christian perfection clearly enough, uh, you will see that actually Wesley believes that many people experience entire sanctification at a point in their life, they just lose it. They're not able to sustain it in their uh, lives. And in the very best of the American holiness tradition, if we fundamentally, which the American holiness tradition really picks up on this idea of the spirit reigning and ruling in the heart and, and directing our, our desires, uh, realizes that, in fact, there may be moments, because there is no level of sanctification in this life, no entire sanctification or Christian perfections that set us free from the possibility of sin. And I will say that the best of the American holiness tradition has recognized that there may be at times and places where the spirit in a moment is not reigning and ruling in our lives. And we experience what Wesley would call a sin of surprise. 
Now, a sin of surprise is not intentional sin. It's something that sneaks up on us. And we commit it in the moment. But we know before we committed it, we know it in the moment we commit it, and we know in the moment afterwards is sin. Please hear me. If there is a weakness at times in our American holiness tradition is that we have simply had very poor understanding of sin. And so on, sometimes in our Western holiness tradition, if it's not intentional, if it's not willful, uh, it's not sin. Excuse me, that's not biblical, nor is it theological, nor is it Wesleyan in regard to Wesley. Now, please hear me. There is sin that is a transgression of the known law of God that's not intentional, and it needs to be confessed and repented of. But in this, um, in the American holiness tradition, there's a recognition, please hear me, generally speaking, walking in the power of the spirit, staying free from intentional sin. But there may be a moment that arises where the spirit is not reigning and ruling in our heart in that moment, and a sin of surprise comes upon us. What do we do with it? We confess it, and we go on. We don't have to start all over again. And so, again, there's that optimism uh, in the very best of our American holiness. So uh, we can be free from sin, but it doesn't mean that uh, we won't ever commit uh, I I any sin. And uh, when we do find ourselves with a sin of surprise in our life, it's to confess it and go on, be restored. And let me just pause here for a moment to, to talk about this, to talk about this. Now, I, I know uh, uh, Chris uh, likes to talk about love as uh, self-giving, self-giving love, and I, I believe that. And he gets that. Uh, it, it's a part of the historic Christian tradition. Thomas Aquinas is, is very clear that love is to will the good of, of, of the others. But there's also a part of our historic Christian tradition that understands love as union. That whatever you love, you desire union, fellowship, and oneness with. And that you align your will with that desire. So just to give you an example, if I love ice cream, what am I telling you? I want to be one with ice cream. You scream ice cream, we all scream for ice cream. Yeah, uh, and, but it's not just the desire. It means I align my will with that desire. So that I go out and buy Ben and Jerry's Heath Bar Crunch. Uh, ice cream, Heath Bar Crunch ice cream. I go and buy it. And then I take it home and eat it. Desire and will bringing about union. If I say to, the, to you that I love my wife, what am I telling you? I desire to be one with her. I desire fellowship with her. And I make decisions and choices bring that union about. Jesus said, if you love me, this is John chapter 14. If you love me, you will obey me. I think he says it eight times in John chapter 14. If you love me, you obey me. What is Jesus saying? If you want to walk with me, if you want to be with me, you will align your will with my will. You will align my will. And, and that's what brings about union. The desire to be one with Christ and aligning our will with that desire. But what happens in a sense of surprise is there's a break. There's a rupture in that union. And I will take one of the most beautiful examples for me, um, again, of, of the sanctified life, is when someone experiences a sin of surprise and what they do with that sin. If you want more than anything else, union with Christ, that's what drives your life. And in a moment, there is disruption. It is the worst thing to ever experience in your relationship. And what do you want? You want reconciliation. Let me say this as well. To love our neighbor. To love our neighbor means to desire reconciliation. And to work towards reconciliation. But here, this is where I wanted to come back to Chris. But ultimately, we give ourselves in love. We seek union, not for our benefit but to give ourselves to the other. 
to serve the other. So it's not about what I get or gain. It's about what I give and serve to the other. This is beautifully portrayed in an early Christian theologian who believed in Christian perfection. And uh, this is book 11 in his conferences, John Cassian, in which he writes on perfection. And John Cassian says that there are three stages to the Christian life. The first stage is that we serve God out of fear. We don't want to go to hell. We don't want to pay the consequences for our sin. Amen? What's the problem? It's really about us. We love God for our own sake. We seek union with God for our own sake. But then Cassin goes on and says that we uh, serve God. Once we pass out of fear, we serve God for God's benefits. So the peace that he brings, the joy that he brings, the happiness that he brings. And so we love God for God's benefits. But what's the problem? Still all about us. So we still are seeking union with God for our sake. But Cassin says what Christian perfection is, is to come to the third stage of life, which is to love God for God's sake not about what I get or gain. And so any of you who are familiar with uh, St. John of the Cross, Dark Night of the Soul. The dark night of the soul is when God purges us of our feelings and our emotions, our warm fuzzies. He brings us to a place that we wonder, may wonder even if there is a God and where are you, God? Where is the presence of God? God takes us through that moment because what we're recognizing in that moment is that We really love the warm fuzzies more than we do God himself. Okay, all I want to say is that we have, in in, in many ways, some nuances to our understanding of sin's condition and even perfect perfect love. At times, the American, um, uh, I mean, at times, uh, John Wesley and the Wesleyan tradition, although there are debates in early Methodism over this, set a very incredibly high bar for what entire Uh, sanctification is and what perfect love is and so you can read them as if you are always loving God to the full extent that you are capable of loving God but the American holiness tradition recognizes in many ways what Thomas Aquinas in his discussion of Christian perfection that what happens in entire sanctification is the removal of all obstacles to our heart tending in the love of God and in the love of neighbor And so, yes, we're always loving God and always loving neighbor. We may not, maybe because of bodily infirmities for other purposes, we may not in every moment always loving God to the full extent that we are capable of uh, of loving. So there are some nuances as the best of the holiness thinkers have thought about this. I I think that they they, they nuance uh, salvation from sin's condition in perfect love in very helpful ways. Fourth, Holiness tradition makes explicit what uh, the longer way doesn't, and that is to recognize that entire sanctification and Christian perfection empowers for ministry, this empowerment for ministry. Um, So um, if you read the American holiness tradition, its articles of religion, its confessions of faith, when it is describing entire sanctification, it's not just being set free from the power of sin, not just being set from the of sin it's being empowered for ministry and it makes this very explicit and and it should shouldn't it if you have been set free to love your neighbor as yourself love your neighbor that who is the stranger among us the one who is the enemy among us and again at the very heart of love is the desire for union and working and striving uh, to 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 that union, but there's this empowerment for ministry. So um, I mean, this is the reason why the American holiness tradition, in many ways, believes that everybody who's in ministry should be entirely sanctified, should be a spirit filled believer, because that's the only way you're going to make it in ministry and be faithful in it. Empowerment to serve. 
the ungrateful. Empowerment to serve the backbiting. Empowerment to serve those who would seek to undermine and tear you down. And maybe even tear down your family. Uh, now I've just said for all those of you who are pastors, you know exactly what. And nobody who's in pastoral ministry has, who hasn't experienced all of those. All right, I've got to go on. I, I was going to use an illustration here, but I, I, I will go on. I, but um, empowerment for ministry. And, and fifth, the longer way often leads to a practical problem. And that is little expectation of entire sanctification actually leads to lack of seeking it. If I don't expect to ever really be entirely sanctified in this life or maybe just before death, then there is really little expectation uh, to seek it now in life. And so that is a practical problem. All right. So those are what I would consider the advantages of the American holiness is the benefit of what the American holiness tradition has uh, and the shorter way tradition has brought to, to this discussion. All right. Now I want to talk about the great weakness, though, of the American holiness shorter way uh, tradition. Um, as the holiness tradition has taught Christians about how to experience entire sanctification, this is E1 for those of you who are following. As the holiness tradition has taught Christians about how to experience entire sanctification, it has fallen into semi-Pelagianism or what I would call soft semi-Augustinianism, which is this idea in, in the American holiness tradition, and you know it, and many of you have preached it or taught it at some point along the way. If you want to experience entire sanctification, what are the two things you do? You entirely consecrate yourself to God and you exercise saving faith in Christ to believe Christ to do this sanctifying work in your life. But here's the problem with the American holiness tradition. Not that those are wrong, but the American holiness tradition, because it has been influenced either intentionally or unintentionally, it has been influenced by either a semi-Pelagian tradition or a soft Augustinian position. I'll talk a little bit more about this in, in just a minute. But the American tradition really does believe that we have the power within ourselves to do everything necessary to appropriate the work of entire sanctification. So we have the ability within ourselves to be able to recognize the truth of entire sanctification. Uh, we have the ability within ourselves to consecrate ourselves completely and entirely to God. We have the ability within ourselves to completely surrender to God. And we have the ability within ourselves to be able to exercise sanctifying faith in Christ. To give you an example of this, and, and please hear me, I have tremendous respect for Dr. Alan Brown and a very godly man, great preacher. He's a New Testament scholar, Dr. Alan Brown of God's Bible School. And, and, and we see sort of the semi-Pelagian or soft semi-Augustinian tradition, and this represents the American holiness tradition, how do we experience entire sanctification? First, Christians are to present themselves to God in full surrender. Underlying Dr. Brown's assumption here is that we actually have the ability to do that. Second, uh, we are by faith to ask the God of peace to sanctify us and believe that he, he does it. Again, underlying is that we have this ability within ourselves to exercise sanctifying faith in Christ. And then third, to really show that we have truly exercised faith in Christ for the work of entire sanctification. Third, uh, we are to testify to others that by faith, um, God has received our full surrender and has entirely sanctified us. And so how do we show that we have sanctifying faith? Well, the way that we show it is we go and begin to talk about that we've been entirely sanctified whether or not we've actually seen any evidence of it uh, in, in our life, because we take it by faith. But again, underlying this is this idea that we have the ability within ourselves to do everything. So from the shorter way tradition in the American holiness tradition, we have the power to decide the day or the moment that we're entirely sanctified. We have the day. We're able to, to decide uh, that, uh, that moment. 
Now, this is the third point. The holiness tradition's confidence in the human ability to fulfill the requirements to be entirely sanctified has led to a lot of practical problems. It's led to a lot of practical problems. Uh, one of those things that it has uh, led to is people claiming to be entirely sanctified who are, in fact, not entirely sanctified. I will tell you, as you know, this teaching on holiness has fallen on hard times. And there's a history behind it that goes back to the 40s and 50s. It has to do with the baby boomers, many of them. Uh, they were raised in holiness congregations where people were testifying to the experience of entire sanctification and it was so obvious to them and everyone around them that in fact that wasn't the case. And so uh, many baby boomers coming out of the holiness tradition have either rejected our Wesleyan teaching or they have fallen into the longer way in regard to the understanding of it. So it's led people to testifying to, to, to the experience. Uh, second, it's led to increased frustration because people go to the altar or they have a discussion with their pastor and their pastor tells them exactly what needs to be done. Consecrate, believe, and testify. And they do exactly what their pastor has told them to do. They've checked the list and they still haven't experienced it. And so they grow discouraged. And again, either leave the Wesleyan tradition or they fall back into the longer way. There's some other problems that are there, but for time purposes, I need to, 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 to move on. So there are advantages, but let me just say this. This is for, this is what I call the Achilles heel of the Wesleyan holiness tradition, the 19th century American holiness tradition. So what am I proposing here? Please hear me. I want to take the very best of the American, best of the shorter way. I want to take the very best of this optimism, and I do firmly believe and agree that this is the normative Christian life. But we need to get rid of our semi-Pelagian, soft semi-Augustinian theology that has undergirded it in regard to the experience of it. So what I'm trying to do here and articulating, I'm, I'm calling this a neo-holiness theology. And again, trying to take the very best of the American holiness tradition and combine it with not a semi-Pelagian or a soft semi-Augustinian, but with Wesley's semi-Augustinian theology of grace. And I'm going to illustrate that in just a moment. So what I'm trying to do is to navigate between the longer way and the shorter way and I, I use the term as a middle way, a, a middle way between uh, the two, a neo-holiness middle way. And, and please, that middle way that we're trying to I'm trying to articulate in this book is to really take seriously that entire sanctification is the normative Christian life. This is the life that is meant for every believer. But then what I'm trying to do is combine it with Wesley's semi-Augustinian understanding of grace and the necessity of grace to help us to see the truth of entire sanctification as the normative Christian life, to have grace to help us to truly surrender our lives to God and to truly have sanctifying faith. So let me take just a moment and, and talk about John Wesley's doctrine of prevenient grace and the holiness tradition's do doctrine of prevenient grace. They're different, quite different. And so I'll, I will just say this. Uh, how many of you in here have heard prevenient grace? I mean, even our liberal United Methodists at least have some knowledge of, of, of prevenient grace in, in, in the midst of this. But let me talk about John Wesley's doctrine of prevenient grace. Wesley is Augustinian in that he believes as a result of the fall, we're dead in God, dead in sin, dead, dead, dead. 
And so we actually have no internal resources to offer in the work of salvation. How many of you realize if you're dead, you have nothing? There's no life in you. You have nothing to offer. Do I hear an amen? Amen. If you're dead. So if we are going to be saved and if we're going to be sanctified, then God is the one who has to take the initiative. And the way that he takes that initiative is that he gives prevenient grace. Amen. But let's talk about what Wesley meant by prevenient grace at this point. Bare minimal. Bare minimal. The prevenient grace that is given to all is twofold. It is a restoration of our capacity to receive grace. Now, please hear me. Grace for Wesley, and I think he's absolutely right, is not some sort of substance, something that God gives to you, but rather grace, and Wesley describes grace in his children's catechism as the power or the work of God. So prevenient grace is the restoration of our capacity for God to work for us and in us. So it's a restoration of our capacity for God to work for us and in us. But then second, it is a restoration of our capacity to either cooperate or resist what God is doing. And that's all it is. So please hear me. The prevenient grace that is given to all cannot determine how God wants to work for you or in you in any given moment. All it can do is receive it and either cooperate or resist it. And so from Wesley's perspective, um, you can't see the truth of the gospel, much less the truth of the full gospel, unless the Holy Spirit illuminates it to you. And if you think with me for a moment, how many biblical scholars do we know that read over and love God and read the scriptures, but don't see this? Only the spirit can do it. And prevenient grace enables, but unless the spirit comes and illuminates, there's nothing to work with there. The same thing in regard to repentance. The only way that we can truly repent, whether that be evangelical repentance, the repentance leading to the new birth, or the repentance of believers that leads to the experience of entire sanctification, is a result of the convicting, wooing, and drawing power of the spirit. It is not something we are able to do. We can only truly repent when God is bringing convicting grace in our lives. The same thing in regard to faith. We tend at times, the American holiness tradition tends to think that faith is something that we can humanly generate at any given moment. But it is a gift of grace. And so we can only experience saving faith Sanctifying faith as the Holy Spirit comes and creates it in our hearts and lives. And as the Spirit is seeking to impart it to our lives, we can either, through prevenient grace, we can either, let me just see your hands. I'm, I'm going too long now. I'm almost done. Uh, we can either cooperate. Let me just see it. Oh, come on, all of you here. We can either cooperate, embrace it, or we can resist it. Many of you know this, but let me be clear. We see this so clearly in John Wesley's Aldersgate experience. This has to do with salvation. Please, I apologize, Albert Outler, uh, Randy Maddox. You have misinterpreted Wesley. You haven't listened to Wesley. Wesley always understood his Aldersgate experience to be his conversion experience. And please hear me. Um, Wesley, months before, through a conversation with Peter Bowler, became convinced that salvation was by grace through faith but he didn't have it. On May 24th, 1738, his Aldersgate experience, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I want you to know Wesley was being acted upon. His saving faith was not self-generated. Rather, it was a gift that was given to him. I felt my heart strangely warmed and I did believe that Christ died for me, even me. John Wesley in the scriptural way of salvation says, sanctifying faith is a gift of grace. It is not something we are capable of doing. He uses the language of divine evidence and conviction. First, it's a divine evidence and conviction that God has promised it in the scriptures. And I will tell you, it takes the Holy Spirit of God to help people to see the truth of it in in scripture. 
So even with the great work that Matt and uh, Dr. Ayers and Dr. Friedman have, have done, I would tell you the only way that this is going to convince anybody of the truth of Scripture is the Holy Spirit using the very words that Dr. Ayers and Dr. Friedman have written to open their eyes, to give them eyes to see. Divine evidence that God has promised in Scripture. Second, divine evidence in conviction. Something the Holy Spirit gives divine evidence and conviction that what God has promised in the scriptures, he in fact is able to do. But you know, it's one thing to be able to believe that God, the, teach, the scriptures teach it. It's another thing to believe that God actually does it. I, I love um, Sinclair Ferguson, a good reformed uh, theologian in his discussion of the reformed understanding of sanctification. He makes this, this statement. It looks like in Romans chapter eight that uh, Paul seems to be saying here, that uh, we can live free from sin. But we know as Christians, that's not true. That is what he says. It's one thing to become convinced intellectually that this is the teaching of scripture, but I will tell you if you've had poor models of it in your life, if you've grown up in a context that has continually doubted it in, in, in your life, I tell you, it takes the spirit of God to help you to believe and in fact, what God has promised scripture, he's able to do. Third, Wesley says, he's able to do it in you. I don't know about you, but most of my life, I'm always, I believe God can do great things. Amen. It's just a lot more, or it, it is, it's a lot easier for me to believe that God can do it in someone else. As opposed to believe that God can do it in me. Wesley believed that God had saved Peter Bowler by grace through faith. Wesley struggled with believing that God could do it for him. And then uh, Wesley says, last of all, and it's all, all of these, it's divine evidence and conviction that God does it even now in you. But it's a gift of grace. Uh, and, and this is different than the uh, 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 holiness traditions doctrine of prevenient grace. The holiness traditions doctrine of prevenient grace is far more robust. Uh, Wesley's understanding of prevenient grace is that we can receive, we can be worked upon by God. And we can either cooperate or resist it. But if there's not more grace that is given, right, we can't go any further. We're completely dependent upon God giving grace, working for us and in us. The American holiness tradition, though, basically, grace is the restoration of our capacity to see, repent, and believe. So that, again, we can do it at any moment that, uh, that we choose. One last word, and I, I, I have gone too long. but. Um, one last word. Uh, please hear me. In many ways, this Wesleyan holiness tradition, this semi-Pelagian, at times a soft semi-Augustinian position, really has a transactional view of salvation. More like a business and legal transition, transaction. So here's what we were talking. Have you done this, 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 and this? Then you're sanctified. You've done this, 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 and this. You are saved. As a matter of fact, as pastors, we will say, Okay, have you done this? Have you done this? Have you done, have you done these four things? Whether you have the witness of the Spirit, whether or not you've genuinely experienced conversion or entire sanctification, you have it. It's like a business and legal transaction. I will tell you, Wesley's semi-Augustinian theology here is deeply interpersonal. It's not transactional. It's not transactional. So, even today, right now, I can't determine how God wants to work for me or in me or through me. I can't. How many of you realize that today you cannot determine how God wants to work for you? Yet, nevertheless, we believe God is at work for you and in you. All you can do, though, today is have this posture and not this. And so from this, let me just say this from this Wesleyan semi-Augustinian you can't determine the day or the moment. You're entirely sanctified. All you can do, and this is Wesley, is seek the Lord in the means of grace until he comes and brings it to you. And please hear me, this is our message. He'll do it sooner rather than later. He'll do it sooner rather than later in our lives. And this is this neo so so what is the neo holiness council regarding the experience of time? You know, surrender fully uh, to Jesus Christ, make a total consecration of life to God, uh, as much as you're able, uh, with that which grace has given to you. 
But I will tell you this, and I don't know about you, I, I don't know my own mind or very our heart. And I will tell you this, we very rarely ever grasp the depths of depravity in our lives. And so I'll be honest with you, my own experience in regard to this is I could say, oh, yes, I was fully surrendered to the Lord. I'd given everything to God. And then I'd find, oh, no, you didn't. Here's some areas that you were hanging on, you know, in, in your life. So even full surrender isn't something that we, we are capable of doing in our own strength and, and, and power. And sometimes surrender is a process that God gives in, in our lives as the, as the Spirit is working and moving in us. But surrender, obviously surrender. Make a total consecration. Believe in the divine work of entire sanctification. And if you can't believe it, that's all right. Ask God for faith to believe. You don't believe that the scripture teaches this? Well, ask God, God, if this is true, show me in your word. Give me eyes to see. Give me ears to hear. And then if you believe this teaching of scripture, but you have trouble believing that God does it, maybe because of poor experiences, you, you, you saw it and didn't receive, or because you had such poor examples in, in your life, Lord, give me faith to believe that you do do this in people's hearts and lives. Third, God, I, I see it in other people's lives. I just have, have a hard time believing you can do this for me. How many of you notice, I, I, oftentimes it can begin in the head, but it takes a lot longer for it to penetrate your heart. I, I, I will tell you, it's grace that, that imparts it to our minds and it's grace that imparts it to our hearts so that we believe it at the depths of our soul and then to believe that God can do it uh, in, in a moment. So believe in the work of entire sanctification. And let me just say this, ask Christ in faith for entire sanctification now in your life. Please hear me. This is the normative Christian life. But if God doesn't sanctify you in the moment that you ask for it, don't settle for anything less. And then continue to seek the Lord to come and sanctify you wholly until he died in the means of grace. Well, this is, and I, I apologize, I've gone way too long. Uh, I, I took, I'm supposed to take 40 minutes, sorry. Uh, but uh, this is at least towards a, a neo-holiness uh, middle way uh, theology that it seeks to try to navigate between the longer way and the shorter way and articulate a middle way here. Well, Chris, if you would have had a health bar this morning and not a Heath bar, maybe you would have been able to shave off uh, that's right, 20 that's minutes. Right. That's right. Sorry about yeah, that. A health bar will do that. That's too. right. A Heath bar would have given me the energy. At yeah, some point, energy. you will be entirely sanctified. <laughs> okay. I What a delight. What a, for us to be able to hear this message, which brings together kind of Definitely, we had a sermon this morning in a sense, but also definitely a, a systematic treatment of this. So, Chris, thank you for blending your gifts and helping us understand this more clearly. Uh, Dr. Yike, would you come and, and offer a response here? Got uh, some of this outline ahead of time and even told me this morning he was listening to the book on tape. It's made its way to Audible. So already is a part, in part there. If you could use this microphone, even though. Be glad to. Be glad to. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation, Andy, to uh, make this response. And I'm I'm tempted because I think we've been to church. I'm tempted to say amen and sit down, but uh, but I'm going to ask to do this. So I'm going to do this. So um, I want I want to say at the out, outset that how much I appreciate not only the work of this book, but uh, Chris's presentation today because I think this is a absolutely critical conversation for our moment in time today. Um, you know, we've got new forms of Methodism emerging in the GMC, which I'm a part of, and, and others. And this, this is something we've got to get a hold of. This is something I think is critical uh, for the future of the church. Um, I, I was participating in a, in a group not long ago, and uh, someone made the comment, you know, we live in a world where sin is romanticized and holiness is vilified. Um, and and we, we've got it. That's the part of the battle that we have to fight. So so I think this is this is incredible. It also reminds me of what started me on my own Ph.D. research, which was a bumper sticker that I saw on a car 
that said Christians aren't perfect, they're forgiven, which I knew, I understood the sentiment there, but we have a different message, don't we? We have a different message. Um, when I started my, my research, and this is just an appreciation for you, Chris, um, you know, this, this is such an important subject, and uh, Debbie Sangster was a Methodist minister. He, he made this comment. I want to read just a, a couple of quotes here because I think it helps us just kind of think about the importance of this. And he, he cast a vision beyond what we might say is nominal Christianity. I mean, that was, that was Wesley's concern. He wanted to be a real Christian, not a nominal Christian. Um, but Sangster says this. He says, this is sure. There is an experience of God, of the Holy Spirit, available to all who will seek it with importunity, which imparts spiritual power far above the level enjoyed by the average Christian, which inspires a caring, godlike, different in kind and degree from the affections of normal nature, which communicates to the eager soul the penetrating power of holiness. No book can give this experience. It belongs to the secret intercourse of the soul with God. It lies at the very heart of personal religion. Its wide reception would transform the church and shake the world. That's why I think this is so, so important. And, and again, I want to I want to say my words of appreciation, Chris, for this helpful critique of these two paradigms, kind of helping us see clearly um, the thinking that's gone on in the last, you know, couple of hundred years since Wesley, um, a really helpful exploration of the longer way, uh, which I have to confess that that was my life uh, growing up in the mainline Methodist church, uh, the longer way. It was an extraordinary experience, not an ordinary. So I think that was really help helpful. I also uh, really appreciated the practical problem of the longer way, the, you know, and again, I think that's what made me react to that Christians aren't perfect, they're forgiven, is that, wow, if that's all the Christian life is, is just, I keep messing up and I'm forgiven, I keep messing up and I'm forgiven, that's, that's not the kind of life I want. I don't think that's the kind of life anybody in here wants, right? Uh, so I, again, incredibly helpful. I think, I think to do otherwise, we just are, are doing sin management, and, and that's no life, that's no kind of life. Um, again, also helpful uh, exploration of the semi-Pelagian and Pelagian leadings of the shorter way. Uh, ironically, Chris, I think this mirrors some of the progressive view of humanity and the changes in mainstream Methodist theology. Uh, noted in Child's work, uh, he talks about how you know you go from Watson to Miley to Knudsen, uh, and original sin becomes less and less uh, talked about uh, or believed in, if you will. Um, and, and so I think I think you see that. And one interesting thing, one sign of the longer way is that in uh, 1936, uh, the Book of Discipline in the Methodist Church, they got a, they eliminated Wesley's charge to his preachers, where he said, you know, your job is not just to do this, that, and the other; it's to build people up in holiness, without which they cannot see the Lord. So, all right. So appreciation all the way around. Questions. Um, first is a question of language. Uh, shorter, longer in your critique, are there alternatives there? Uh, I, I just wonder if there's a better way of, or a different way of, of, of talking about either expectation, near or far, uh, scarcity versus abundance, um, you know, maybe even God's sovereignty, our view of God's sovereignty, because if God is sovereign, God can do it now, you know. Um, so anyway, just questions about language. Is, is there a way to, to think about that? Also, uh, a question is, and this, this might take a longer conversation, Chris, but maybe one day we can have it. But my research has focused on the relationship between Christian perfection and evangelism. So I really wonder, what are the implications here for evangelism? Um, and, and just a quick quote from, from Wesley, which I think is helpful here. Uh, in, in the general spread of the gospel, he says, the holy lives of the Christians will be an argument they will not know how to resist. Seeing the Christians steadily and uniformly practice what is agreeable to the law written on their own hearts, their prejudices will quickly die away. They will gladly receive the truth that is in Jesus. And of course, in that sermon, he begins by saying the grand stumbling block to the gospel is the lives of Christians. 
So, um, so I think there's some definite implications for evangelism here. Uh, my biggest question, though, as you describe this middle way, it seems that, and maybe you just had to have time in the treatment to do this, but it seems to me that sometimes what we do in Wesley's studies is we extract Wesley's theology out of the context of the revival in which it was birthed. Um, and so my question, Chris, is, is the missing ingredient here, uh, because it seems to be a very individualistic approach, you know, we are pursuing Christian perfection. But in Wesley's day, and I think in the best eras of Methodism, we were pursuing it together. It was community. Uh, there were bands, there were classes, there were places where people were put in community where we could help each other figure out what does it mean to follow Jesus? Because I can't do that by myself. Uh, I can't see my own sin sometime. I, I need someone else to help me, to hold me accountable, to speak into my life. And so that's, uh, I think that's the, the big question there. And then the other question is, how do we cultivate that hunger for this? And just a very pastoral question. How do we, as pastors, as teachers, how do we cultivate that hunger uh, in our congregations? So I, I tried to make it really quick, uh, but uh, uh, sorry. And, uh, but really appreciated it. Wonderful presentation. I look forward to talking more about it. Uh, talk about a what Wesley would call a set of infirmity, uh, not intentional at all. Uh, I was given 40 minutes and took uh, 55 minutes and uh, took away from my brother's uh, uh, response. Uh, let me just say a, a couple of things. I, I really appreciated um, the questions uh, that were, were raised. Uh, the first one that uh, Brian raised had to do with the nature of, of language. So uh, longer way, shorter way and stuff. And I'll have to say this, that all I'm doing is, is using terms that have been historically used uh, in, in regard to this. Um, as a matter of fact, I think uh, that I'm the one who has coined this middle way uh, term. I am the one who coined this, uh, th this term to try to differentiate between this shorter and uh, in, in, in the middle, middle way. So trying, uh, all this to say, trying to find the very best language it's the same thing in regard to uh, calling this neo-holiness. I'm trying to find a term to try to describe this theologically. This has more to do with scholars than it does anything else. But uh, let me say this. I'm not against trying to think of more creative language. Um, I think the person who's done the best job in thinking about and appropriating our language in a way that's different, that's, I think, effective in communicating is, in fact, Randy Maddox in his discussion of irresponsible grace. Now, I end up disagreeing with Maddox on a number of points, but his creativity and uh, development of language that is uh, that 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 is there, and so uh, I I am certainly open to alternative language. One thing I'm not open to, one thing I'm not open to is using non-scriptural language. So we use the language of perfection. Why? Because the Scripture uses it, and historic Christianity uh, uses it. Uh, so there are things we can play around with. I don't think we can play around with the, the scriptural language, not that you were implying that at, at, at all. And so um, as my two brothers know who helped uh, on this book, uh, there's no creativity in Chris Bounds. Uh, and and as, as my wife knows, there is no creativity in, uh, in, in Chris Bounds. Uh, all the creativity is on, on uh, in, in my wife, but I appreciate it when, it, when it's done. Uh, second, in regard to Christian perfection and evangelism, uh, two things uh, that I would say. First of all, I'm always reminded of Athanasius on the incarnation of the word. You quoted Wesley, I'll quote Athanasius. Uh, Athanasius, uh, I, I love on the incarnation of the word because he's writing to an, unbelie an unbeliever or you know, trying to justify, although there are debates on whether it's an unbeliever or not, but I, I do believe it's an apologetic work. Uh, and he says, you want to see the truth of Christianity, go to where the demons are and speak the name of Jesus and see what happens. I, I, I love Athanasius on the incarnation of the word because of his uh, multifaceted approach to apologetics. But he also says, related, you want to see the truth of Christianity, look at the lives of Christians. I'm reminded of uh, 
Carl uh, Roberts, I'm reminded of Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania. Carl Roberts went into a one room Amish schoolhouse and uh, killed five people, wounded three others. Remember this, I think it was in 2007. And of course, news of that spread across the United States. The next thing that happened spread across the world. And that was this Amish community and some of the parents and grandparents of the victim, Roberts, the gunman, went to his widow to tell her that they forgave Carl Roberts. Some of the same people went to Carl Roberts' funeral. That Amish community raised a trust fund for Carl Roberts' children. I will tell you, news of the tragedy spread across the world. The response of the Amish community to the tragedy spread across the world. And even though the world had no categories whatsoever in which to understand it, they couldn't help but be drawn to the beauty of it, even though they could not understand it. I, I really do love and I really do believe in the beauty of holiness. Holiness, when it is true holiness and it is lived out, it is the most convincing argument for the truth of, of the gospel. But the second thing I want to say in regard to Christian perfection and evangelism, and this has to do with this idea of being perfected in love. If I really am loving my neighbor as myself, then there is something that is driving me to share the gospel with my neighbor who does not know Jesus. Because the ultimate way that, that I can be one with my neighbor and my unbelieving neighbor is for them to come to Christ. Because that is where the reconciliation, that is where the oneness is, uh, is, is brought about. So please hear me. If Christian perfection, entire sanctification doesn't lead to evangelism, not only with our lives, but with our testimony as well, and being driven to the least, the last, and the lost, then it would, for me, call into question whether or not it's been you know, genuine holiness or not. Uh, next is, and you're right out of the context, I do deal with this. As a matter of fact, this was initial sort of critique work that I did um, in, in the book was what about the social aspect of this, particularly social in the sense of community. And, and uh, please hear me there. Wesley's absolutely right. There is no social, uh, holiness that is not social. And uh, this is a problem with the American holiness tradition at times. Uh, because uh, what happens after the Civil War is the dropping of the requirement for many of, uh, of, the, of these denominations of uh, the class meeting uh, that is there. And then uh, how to cultivate that hunger. Well, I am thoroughgoing. This doesn't mean a lot other than I tried to put it forward. I'm semi-Augustinian, and I really do believe the cultivation of hunger, it always begins with prayer. Because I cannot incite hunger. No matter how hell, uh, you know, no matter how eloquent or powerful uh, a speaker, preacher, you know that I am. Only the Holy Spirit of God. We're completely dependent upon the Holy Spirit of God to do that. And so, it really does begin with prayer. It really, I will say that it really begins with prayer. It really begins with prayer. It really does begin with prayer. And of course, this was a point that, that Caleb made so beautifully uh, last night as well. So anyway, thank you for your comments and, and those questions. Go ahead and stay up there, Chris, just for a second. Wait, a, a little uh, more engagement from online, and then I'll invite some folks in the room to respond after I read this question uh, from somebody who is with us online. I don't know who this is. So I can't say their name. Um, they, they describe for a bit some of their experiences in kind of shorter way world where there is a uh, condemnation towards people who aren't seeking it enough um and so like the then the if this all begins with the individual and a high view of the individual or some Pelagian type of view then like the the fault is then on the person who's just not seeking enough so then they the the, the question is um would you say that the neo-holiness middle way would not lead to condemnation to these individuals, but rather emphasize that it is God's work that he will do in his own good time sooner rather than later, but that it is not a fault of the individual seeking. Well, let me say this. Uh, I do think that Wesley, again, very helpful 
advice, plain account of Christian perfection, that we should always preach entire sanctification of Christian perfection in a way that draws and does not drive. That we should preach the beauty of, uh, of, 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 of a holiness in a way that draws and does not drive uh, people. And at times, the American holiness tradition, and this was true in Wesley's day as well, uh, they preached it at times in a way that, uh, that uh, drove and, and did not uh, draw uh, people who were, uh, who were there. Um, let, me, but, but let me say this. I, I'm generally in agreement with what uh, this, uh, this person has said. Although here's the need for the, the social uh, in, in, in community. Uh, obviously, if a person is not seeking, uh, obviously, if a person is uh, sort of content where they are in their spiritual life, apart from living this normative Christian life, to a certain extent, in love, they need to be called out uh, on, on that, in, in love. But again, in a way that draws and does not drive. Um, I'm a huge believer and proponent of discipline. Uh, the church rightly ordered the exercise of the power of the keys. But church discipline must always be done uh, redemptively and not punitively. It is always being done in a way that draws uh, people in, in, into the community. Great. Thank you, Chris. Does anybody have a question or something they'd like to ask Dr. Bounds? There? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bounds. I really enjoyed this presentation a lot. This was excellent. Um, my question concerns your characterization of the shorter way, and particularly Dr. Brown's advice there on how to uh, seek entire sanctification. And you described this as, as being, we have everything within ourselves. We have the ability within ourselves. It's about human ability. And I, I suspect that Dr. Brown would, would disagree with that characterization. And I, I wonder, I have an idea of what he might say and just wanted to see if i get your response to that well if you look um, at the book it, it it's it's taken from three easy steps to sanctification uh -huh. on why you can be sanctified even now yeah. yes and and so even the language that i'm using is his language yes yeah I, I just i wonder if he would say something like you know my my advice to those seeking entire sanctification is no more semi-pelagian than Paul's advice to the Philippian oh, jailer. Okay. Let, let, me, let me say this. Uh, Alan Brown's is not a semi-Pelagian. It is soft semi-Augustinian. And this is a, 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 in other words, Alan Brown, because he is Wesleyan, does believe in prevenient grace, but he has a very broad understanding of prevenient grace. So uh, uh, Dr. Brown does believe that we do have, as a result of prevenient grace given to all, the ability to, to be able to consecrate and to exercise faith. Okay. Uh, um, well, I, I want to take time, so maybe we can. Go yeah, 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 oh. yeah. Would would he say then that the difference between his view and your view is not a difference in human ability? Both of you agree that it's by God's grace, yes. and that you know faith, uh, whether it's for salvation or for entire sanctification, is response to the grace of God. That the difference is rather a difference in in. Uh, on a shorter way, there's a confidence that God desires entire sanctification for every Christian now. And that so the only reason why a Christian doesn't experience entire sanctification is because they've resisted that that grace. Um, and, and if that's the case, I, I wonder if it's right to characterize the difference as a difference involving uh, the, you know semi-Augustinianism or, or uh, if it's rather a difference in how we conceive of God's um, plan or in what sense entire sanctification yeah, yeah. is normative. I, I do think you're picking up, I, and I, I would agree with you, that that is a part of what Alan Brown would, would say. And, and a part of the American holiness tradition is God is always ready to sanctify now, entirely sanctify now. And so, again, part of it is if uh, we're not experiencing it, then the problem is on our part, our part. And uh, again, slightly different from this Wesleyan understanding of prevenient grace is this moment may not be the moment that God wants to sanctify you. Maybe there is something that God needs to do uh, in more preparation for you to be entirely sanctified. There is more ground that needs to be plowed so that the most uh, optimal, when, when God imparts this grace to you, uh, it can be uh, most uh, received by you. Um, by the way, actually, uh, Wesley just hints at this, um, but uh, uh, Origen, in his first principles, 
uh, in uh, book two has a very significant discussion on this in which Origen does explore the issue of why does God do something now in a person's life and waits to do the same thing in, in, in someone else's life. And so beginning to, to understand that. And this is where for me, this is important. The difference between a transactional understanding and a deeply interpersonal understanding that, that, is, that is taking place. That what happens in the work of entire sanctification is not a transaction that takes place, but is deeply interpersonal. So what might take place sooner in one person and later in another has to do with the person and, uh, and uh, the, the sort of work that, that needs to be done. Now, of course, our resistance can play a role in that as well, but you can be fully cooperating and, uh, and not necessarily in the moment that you seek it, uh, experience it. I, I, let me just say this, I would agree on some of the nuances that you've drawn out between what, again, I would call uh, utter understanding of grace and this more narrow understanding of prevenient grace. Thank you, that's very helpful. Great, let's give Dr. Bounds a hand. Um, well, what we're going to do here is we're going to make a quick set change and we're going to have a, a short panel discussion. And so after the prayer is offered, then I'll invite our authors to come forward and then we'll start again. And if you choose to leave at this point, that's fine. But we just ask that you don't stay out there and talk very loudly. Okay. Dr. Friedman, will you close some prayer here? Jesus, thanks so very much for the gift and graces. Uh, that you have bestowed upon uh, Chris, we're so very grateful that uh, we have been the recipient of that gifts and uh, of those gifts and those graces today. Uh, and so, Lord, with this message, help us not to just say, "Boy, those are good good thoughts." Help us be motor. Uh, help us be missional with these things. We love you together in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Five minutes. We'll start up here again. Was that no you're here yeah it's, it's more than yeah than anywhere here um it's um just with the three authors and then uh we, we were uh, you sent some questions that's good hopefully i can get to those but you sent to matt yeah and then we'll probably just go out to eat we might not have those dac faculty meetings like we is that what you're asking about all right no you're anywhere that's good it's good Okay, we're gonna get going. Are we good to go, Jeff? Let me ask you this. Oh yeah. All right, I haven't seen you three together. Jeff, let me know when you're ready to go. All right. I feel really close. No. Oh, <laughs> I finally, finally in the proper relationship. There we are. Whatever you need. Oh. Well, this is an important moment for us to have an opportunity to hear from the three authors of this new book, Holiness, a Biblical historical and systematic theology. We have been looking for a book like this. I have been looking for a book like this for years. We needed something like this. Now, one of the things that comes is because there have been traditions and there have been people who have thought through kind of a, a biblical vision of holiness. We think of maybe John Oswald's called to be holy. There have been some other edited volumes, people who have reflected on John Wesley's teaching. There's been um, kind of like some other kind of pastoral level pieces, holiness for everyday people. Uh, people look back to even kind of the American holiness tradition with people like Samuel Logan Brangle or Wood. But I'm so thankful that you three did the hard work. And not only did this just happen, now we could have had this possibly with a, a smaller press or a self-published sort of angle, and it could have served the church well. But I'm delighted too that this book has been published by IVP Academic. So it's a major evangelical publisher that's taking this title on, and you all come at it from your disciplines. So it's a real delight. Thank you all very much for this work.
Now, here's what I'd love to do is just to have each of you summarize the contribution that you think you're making. Now, there's one way that this is a bit of a, um, we've done that kind of in the sessions as a whole, as you've presented like hour long sessions with responses. But what is, what is it that your section is trying to say? Now, there, there is a way, one thing I want us to, I've heard this from each of you, that it's not your desire to kind of contribute to the, the tribalism that we might have. All three of you have vast experience within kind of American holiness movement traditions, um, institutions as well, but we're not just writing something. You're, uh, I, wanted to, I want to join you. We're not, uh, you haven't just written something just for the sake of serving uh, the Wesley Biblical Seminary community. This is a broader, wider expression I, I think of something in service to the church as a whole. So I'd love for you to keep that in mind as you respond. So Matt, why don't you give us a response to like, what's the contribution from your side, from the Old Testament side of what is part of this book? Uh, so what I was trying to accomplish was to avoid just a standard, and Caleb mentioned this, run-of-the-mill word study of Kadesh or um, however you want to look at that. And I really want to take a biblical theological perspective and trace the single thread that is the meta narrative of scripture as it anticipates uh, the atonement and the cross and Pentecost in the Old Testament. And I wanted to do it in a way, and, and John Oswald's called to be holy. It does do that. It's very biblical, theological, meta narrative, an integrated view of all the scriptures. Um, but called to be holy is more of a, I see it more of as a pastoral perspective. And I was trying to do something more from a textbook perspective that integrates some of the voices and perspectives and views of Old Testament studies beyond the tradition mm -hmm. and, and acknowledging those views, being aware of those views and letting those views inform to the point of either agreement or even rebuttal, um, the contribution. And then in addition to that, I would say that, um, I was trying to not only do the biblical theological perspective, but I wanted to draw out the new creation motif that is very present in the Old Testament. Um, we just don't see many Old Testament scholars talking about the new creation motif. And I think that and with regard to the Imago Dei, the image of God, as is prepared for, as I talked about Monday night, in the creation account. And um, I, I believe that I very much agree with N.T. Wright on this, um, that you can't do theology with a concordance. Um, I think concordances are helpful, but you're not going to find Trinity. Um, and that's absolutely essential and fundamental and cornerstone and all those things. And so, um, so while you're not going to find the term, the image and the likeness all throughout the Old Testament, it is the controlling narrative because of the introduction to the Bible, which is Genesis. And so I really wanted to highlight that feature of the new creation idea, um, because I feel like that's really very much present in the Old Testament text and gets ignored. So biblical theological perspective, uh, but in particular, the new creation motif, all informed by the most recent scholarship in a way that either acknowledges, affirms, or rebuts some of those views. Awesome. So the restoration of the image is the kind of one of the pictures from the Old Testament you're tra trying to draw out with the aim, right? With the aim of that being what the New Testament talks about in what is what the call to be holy is. Uh, yes, I would prefer the word the redemption of the image okay. rather than restoration of the image. Now, theologically, I'm fine with the restoration language, but I believe uh, to the point that Chris made of using the biblical language, I feel like that word redemption of the image. Um, I also really wanted to, to Rick Boyd's comment, highlight the missional aspect of holiness. I believe that the point of holiness is not only union with God, but witness to um, who he is, because that's the point of the image bearer, is to bear witness to who the creator is. So union with God, the redemption of the image, and a life that is marked by shalom and chesed to the point of putting it on display for the sake of God's glory in the world. So the, kind of the message full circle to the point of, I think one of the criticisms I've had of our own tradition is that it too, and and, and this could be a wrong criticism, too narrowly focuses on me and my salvation and my salvation experience, the individual. Our salvation experience is not about us. It's about him and his glory and the redemption of the image for the sake of him being amplified in all things. And so I wanted to bring that full circle um, within the, let's say, um, 
within the frame that the Old Testament gives us. It's really helpful. Yeah. So thanks for setting that frame for us uh, so well. I think one of the things I regularly hear, and I heard this in Caleb's presentation last night and Chris's today, and you've said it too, certainly believing, this idea that kind of under what under what I sense throughout the book is the idea that this is the normative Christian experience. So Caleb, give us a little sense too, like you bring your discipline to this study of like what the contribution that you're making, like what what's new in what you're saying. I think one of the big things that just struck me as I was beginning to work on this topic and ramp up for this volume, I had a chance to do some teaching on the topic and one of the things that I shared last night was really formative for me, which was realizing that this really isn't just about a, a few texts, right. right? That happen to have the the key phrases that we've used in our tradition, and those those texts are important, and I treat them, and I'm passionate about them. But it's about a whole, as Matt said, biblical theology, right? A whole way that the Bible fits together, and this this view of the normative Christian life that we see throughout. So I think that really uh, seeing that as being significant and trying to look at holiness with uh, this wide array of different words and phrases and concepts that we have, instead of just trying to limit it to these, these core texts that we all know and love, right? But broadening it out and saying, hey, there's there's so much more. Sometimes when I've taught on this topic with churches, I've, I've called my, my series Holiness in Unexpected Places. Yeah, in, in scripture that yeah, is like right yeah. holiness in unexpected places but they shouldn't be unexpected places right actually i think if if the doctrine of entire sanctification is really true yes it's yes. really scriptural then we should expect to find it communicated but what i'm trying to do in the book i think is to open our eyes to different ways it can be communicated uh, beyond just what we're we're used to uh, one thing i didn't get to talk about last night was the book of james which i do get to talk about in the book and the contrast in James between the teleos life, right, the the perfect life or the complete, morally complete life, mm -hmm. and double mindedness, right, and we don't usually think of James as being a holiness book, right? It does tell us that good works are important, right? But we don't usually think about James being a holiness book. I think it is a holiness book, and I think that we can find this this theme in lots of different kinds of language throughout. I, another thing that I, I do that I haven't seen done before in this way is what I did last night, starting with Luke Acts as setting sort of the narrative frame within which the rest of the New Testament is going to take place. And I think setting that frame from the beginning is really helpful because then you can see, okay, well, Jesus' teachings are fitting into this, the epistles are fitting into this, Revelation is fitting into this narrative that we see here. And I say the final thing, Matt alluded to this as well, but really engaging with the wider world of scholarship. Yeah. So not just interacting with scholars that I agree with and like, uh, like John Oswald, for example, I do quote and use Call to Be Holy a good bit in this book. And that's one of the reasons I think we've we've all been impacted by John well, Oswald. Well, if you dedicate the book to John Oswald. That's why, that's yeah. Right. We've it's just been so significant for the way that we view things. So I, I do use holiness scholars that I know and love, but also interacting with scholars that I know are going to disagree with me and going ahead and showing them, okay, I know that, I know that this, that, yeah, I know that you don't agree with what I'm saying here. That's not what you're most drawn to, but here's why you should, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Or, or I know that wherever, whatever theological tradition someone is coming from, that this may not be their norm, but here's why, here's why it should be, right? And trying to respond to some of those questions and natural rejoinders that people are going, people are going to have. And I think there is a lot more opportunity for doing a lot more of that, as I mentioned last night. It's great. Thank you so much for that. Um, Chris, th this morning we heard from you, and I just want to invite folks, if you didn't get a chance to hear, hear either of our authors' presentations, you can go to our YouTube page. And you can find a link to that and you can see this more in-depth presentation or buy the book, buy the book. We want you to get the book. And, and our, our sense is that this book might be something that could be used as a textbook for decades to come. We're looking forward. It certainly will at Wesley Biblical Seminary. Chris, you take on the task of thinking through the historical and systematic connections here. I'd love for you to say to hit on the historical piece and you, you you dabbed your toe into there just a little bit in the earlier presentation. But just tell us too, like what is it that's often missed, maybe even from within the tradition, about what the historical Christian witness is about holiness? Let me just say this that uh I, I mean 
my background actually did my doctoral dissertation on the doctrine of Christian perfection in the Antonicene Fathers. And uh, I have a book from uh, Brill is, is, is getting ready to publish my, uh, my doctoral dissertation, which be, has been revised. And then working on sort of the doctrine of perfection in the Nicene and post-Nicene Fathers. In other words, I've been driven uh, by this. Um, when I was a graduate student at, uh, at Drew University, I, I, I was convinced of, uh, of, of, of Christian perfection and had read in Odin's um, third volume of his systematic theology, where he saw Christian perfection as, uh, as uh, historic Christian orthodoxy. Um, and so I was interested in seeing it in the text uh, so the primary text, the primary sources as well. And I was blown away, especially in the early church fathers, how prominent uh, the language was. And so, uh, again, working with a number of different passages, but Matthew 548, Matthew 19, which uh, talks about uh, uh, perfection, were, were prominent. And, and particularly the understanding uh, when Jesus says, be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect, is, is really a re, uh, a re uh, rephrasing of be holy as I'm holy, uh, speaking from his, his humanity and how seriously the, the fathers who, who took that. And so um, interested in trying to show that and, and help ground that the teaching on Christian perfection isn't a Wesleyan, I'm going to use my Southern accent here, isn't a Wesleyan thing. Uh, it, 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 it's a, and it's not just a biblical thing. It's a Christian thing, a historical Christian thing that this has been it. And what's been interesting as well is to glean from and learn from the wisdom of, uh, of the historic Christian tradition as they've reflected up upon this. And then also what I try to do is to realize, believe it or not, even the traditions that you don't think would believe such a thing actually have witnesses to it. So uh, there are reformed Calvinist theologians that believe in Christian perfection. Uh, and there are Lutheran theologians who argued for Christian perfection. And uh, even people you think uh, would be poor witnesses to, to the possibility. So someone like Augustine. Uh, Augustine has an incredibly high view of the work of sanctification. Uh, in, in life as well. And so mining the riches that are, are, are there and what can we in our Wesleyan tradition learn from it. And so there are certain ideas that uh, are a part of the historic doctrine of Christian perfection that then inform my sort of systematic treatment uh, as well, sort of trying to draw upon uh, the resources and the wells from the historic Christian tradition and not just our Wesleyan tradition. That's great. Yeah, this is a wonderful contribution that you make to help us see that as well. Um, I want to just talk a little bit about sin. We didn't spend a lot of time on this, and I know that if we had more time, you would have. And Caleb, I just want to start with you in, in, in having heard a paper that you've written um, already on 1 John 5, 18. So we just want to want to go there. And then I'd be curious for the others just to respond, thinking about the nature of sin in believers, quote John Wesley's sermon on that. So um, Caleb, uh, 1 John 5, 18 states, no one is born of God's sins. And then you write on page 167, what John is saying is this is a general rule, God's children do not commit willful sin. Of course, it is possible for them to sin. So how do you reconcile that and this idea with John's assertion in 3.9, he cannot sin? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the key text, I think, and the one that I've focused on the most, both in the book and some other work that I've done beyond the book, is actually 3.9 itself. Okay. And there's... If you look at different translations of this verse, you'll actually notice significant differences between them and it's because everybody's really grappling with the difficulty of the text. So, you know, I have the ESV here uh, in 3.9, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning for God's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Uh, makes a practice of sinning is actually a bit interpretive there. It's It's a little bit more literally would just be uh, the one the one who's born of God does not sin. And that's why we're all trying to grapple with it. What's going on there? I, I actually, this is maybe one of the more uh, more fresh exe exegetical ar arguments I make in the book is that that's actually best interpreted as a gnomic statement. 
So some which interpret- nomic is a grammatical. Yeah. Way- it's, it's a technical Greek term for describing a proverb-like statement of a something that is generally true, uh, as opposed to, for example, doing what the ESV does, which is to try to say, well, actually, it's just talking about uh, not sinning a lot, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, I think I think the Greek is stronger, and I think that there's a way to preserve that without, at the same time, looking at someone who does sin and saying, well you're not a Christian or you haven't experienced a new birth. And so, so I, I spent some time arguing for that uh, versus other possibilities. Now, can, can you restate the, the specific question? Yeah, well, just reconciling this idea with that verse that uh, no one who's born of God sins. Yeah, so I think if we're, if think we're looking to, right. yeah, to yeah. 518, we know that everyone, again, the ESV, who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, uh, but he who is born of God protects him in the evil one does not touch him. Uh, I, I think my answer to the question would be, I take the whole statement in 3.9 as being gnomic. Okay. So uh, he doesn't keep on sinning because he has been born of God. This is also a general, a general statement, right? Now, general statements do not always obtain in every single instance, Okay. right? So there can be exceptions to a rule, and that's fine. And that's actually exactly what we would expect of a gnomic statement. When you read the book of Proverbs, Uh, you don't expect a proverb to actually come true in every single instance, right? I remember an undergraduate professor of mine saying repeatedly in a class on wisdom literature that proverbs are not promises. Hmm. They're they're general general truths, but they're going to be exceptions to the rule. At the same time, I think think what uh, this view would also say, though, is that we shouldn't make the exception the rule. Right. Right. And I think that's that's what sometimes we've done uh, outside the Western tradition or what has been done outside the Western tradition. Also, what the longer way might push us toward. And so this really pushes us to a high view of what the normative Christian life should be. And uh, again, one of the things that strikes me as I look at this passage and as I look at many other passages that we treat in the book is that these are really just about what the Christian life is. Right, the way the Christian life is meant to be lived, it's not talking about some sort of elite version of Christianity. Yeah, so that's great. That's helpful, Chris. Let me just follow up with you with that and one thing. So, uh, what can Christians who are seeking sanctifying grace in this life, um, who are pursuing the, this action of God's work in our lives, what can they expect uh, with regards to sin? Yeah, I actually, I I spent quite a bit of time. Uh, this is. Uh, I'm trying to think this is chapter two Yeah, uh, in my systematic uh, treatment. I talk about the different theological categories of, uh, of, of sin. So trying to think comprehensively and coherently in regard to, uh, to sin. So I talk about uh, sin as a condition, uh, sin as an act, and sin as infirmity, and then different types of sin under those. Again, trying to capture uh, comprehensively the, the, the problem, the issues of, of, of sin. And so uh, there is a sense in which, um, and again, this is always when we think about Christian perfection, entire sanctification, uh, realizing that that we have to qualify that in a certain sense, biblically qualify it. And so entire sanctification is not to be sanctified from absolutely every type of sin uh, that there is. Uh, and uh, Christian perfection is not necessarily be accepted. So I'm talking about sins of infirmity mm-hmm. that we talk about we, that we will continue to have issues of sin of infirmity. But, but uh, what we expect in uh, the work of, of sanctification by way of new birth and by way of entire sanctification, the breaking of the power of sin, and this has to do with intentional sin, uh, habitual sin, uh, addictions. Uh, sense of surprise uh, in our life. And again, acts of sin are sins that we know to be sin. Uh, and we know it to be sin. And some of these are intentional. Some of these are less intentional, you know, in regard, but breaking of the power of sin, acts of sin. But then the sin as a condition is, again, original sin, this bent and propensity that we have towards rebellion and, and disobedience. And so a part of what we expect in the normative Christian life is to be set free from this condition of sin and from the power of sin. And then a part of even the progressive sanctification after this is dealing with issues of sins of infirmity. Mm-hmm. in our lives, which for Wesley has to do with the restoration of the natural and political image uh, of God, you know, in our, our in our lives. But uh, 
I, I do want to pick up on just a, a quick comment that I think is important picking up on this because it's quite possible to read what we've talked about. When, uh, it's quite possible here preaching, teaching on holiness and leave incredibly discouraged. Mm. Uh, you can leave with condemnation if, if, if we're not careful. And it's sometimes the holiness tradition has been guilty of leading people in, in condemnation that is there. But I want to pick up because I think theologically, when we think about the order of salvation or the work of salvation, to make a distinction between an ordo, which is our nice, neat, logical, linear understanding of salvation, and the wea, which is the way that it actually takes place in our life, the messy way that salvation takes place in our life. And very rarely do, does our actual experience of salvation match up with our nice, neat, logical, linear our theological description of, uh, of, of salvation. And we see this in scripture. Uh, so in Romans, the expectation Paul makes out, this is Romans 7, the right. description of Romans 7, 14 through 25 is an unbeliever. Here's someone who's not yet been spiritually uh, regenerated. Um, but Paul primarily is operating ordo. But when we get to him applying to specific situations when people are actually living out their lives, he recognized indeed that there are people he would call Christians who are in fact uh, living in sin, yeah. uh, transgressing the known law of God. And, and so again, the way that uh, Caleb has talked about this is again, in a winsome way, in, in a way that draws, but does not drive. There you go. Yeah, That's great. Well, we only have time for one more question. I'm sorry. We just, we're up, up on a tight schedule. So I just love for each of you just to take, 30, and I'll start here with you, Matt, like a minute. I'm going to say 45 seconds to keep it on the, that side of it. Um, what is your hope for this book? Like, what do you want it to do in the world and, and for the church and for seminary students? So, uh, I mean, you spent time doing this. I, I imagine you guys were, you know, work, you worked for several years. You indicated that your chapter, Matt, you know, you wrote more than three years ago, but yet there's, there's a desire that this message will do something in the world. So Matt, why don't you just start us? What, what's your hope for this book? I, I need to think about it. Does anyone have a quick answer? They're ready to give right now. Here. <laughs> I'll go give it to you. Okay. Wow. Okay. I think uh, the first one thing that I hope for is that people uh, in my own discipline, stop missing the forest for the trees. And I think that I very much agree with John Oswald, not on everything, almost, um, but on the, what's that? I'll quote you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, he said, I'll quote you too. Yeah. On the notion that this is what the Old Testament message is all about. The whole thing together. This is the refrain. Yes, there are movements, there are parts, there are overtures, there are choruses, but the message at the center of the Old Testament is this, an undivided heart. Amen. And that's what is preparing us for the incarnation, that the law is all about bringing sin to the surface so that we can be aware this is the problem. Now, are you ready for the solution? Jesus, right? Amen. So, and, and even as scholars in our own disciplines, you know, we get stuck not only in, on the trees, but on the bark and the ants and the dirt and the, and like, we got to zoom out. We've got to hear the whole thing or else we're going to miss it. We're going to misunderstand it. And, um, and I think that's what the old Testament is driving home. The revelation of sin, the law has done its job and its job is to reveal sin. And not just that we commit sins, not just that we have sinful you know, acts, sins of omission, sins of commission, but sinful behavior, sinful attitudes, sinful thoughts, to the point where it drives us to our knees, no matter how hard we try. We, Romans 7, we can't do this. I need to die and resurrect. And Jesus comes, takes on flesh, and not only reveals God, but he reveals humans. This is the human that God intended. And we miss this. Jesus is the Superman. No, he's the man. Behold the man. This is what God intended in the garden, and it's possible for you now in terms of the purity of your heart. That's beautiful, I beautiful. Now, I'll, I'll give it a best try if we could try to keep it to that one minute type of hope, <laughs> but I would never, I would, that was a beautiful statement. I would never not want that to have existed in the world. And, uh, 
So I'll, I'll just say two things. I think within the Wesleyan world, I would love to see uh, this book contribute just a different baseline of understanding. Uh, sometimes we just don't have what we need accessible. And I hope that our book has made some things accessible that just haven't been accessible together in this form before in a way that engages with the broader academy. So that, that's what I hope for the, the Wesleyan world. And this, this will just be a tool that our churches, right? Uh, we've written it so that hopefully serious lay people, college students, and even uh, seminary students could use this book and really any pastor as well. So I, I hope that it'll become that kind of tool for the Wesleyan movement. Uh, to, the, to the broader world though, I hope that the model of holiness theology that we have argued for throughout the book, which Chris has rightly called a neo-holiness middle way, that this will give people outside the Wesleyan world an option for something they might be able to sign on to, because I think it is the most theologically coherent and biblically faithful version of the doctrine to date. Great. Chris, what's your hope? Yeah, I think... Um... Part of it is for me, uh, it, working as a systematic theologian, is to help people to see holiness uh, as, uh, as the lens through which to see all of Christian theology, all of Christian theology. And so working through the, the major areas of theology, God, creation, fall, redemption, consummation. And I try to do that in, in two, two chapters. So there is sort of taking holiness as a lens through which to do systematic theology. I, that's what I tr try to do. And so to try to help us to think through holiness as a way of thinking about theology as a whole, and then to try to give um, a theological underpinning of how we can enter into the experience of it. And I like the fact that we're unapologetic in inviting people into the experience. Right. And one of the great things I love at the end of the book, you talk about your own testimonies, that as well, and at Wesley Biblical Seminary, one thing that we do is in every class, we want people to testify to the way the Holy Spirit is sanctifying us through and through. Now, we, we nuance that. We want to be careful with how we say that at the same time, not to tend to some of the challenges that have existed within the tradition. But thank you all. Thank you for your time with us. Particularly, we think of, of Chris and Caleb coming and traveling to be with us this week, not just for your work in the book, but, pre but presenting it to us so clearly here these few days. Let's give them a hand. All right. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, students. We'll see you all later. God bless you.